Welcome to Public Health Agency of Canada webinar on National Advisory Committee on Immunization, NACI, extended dose intervals for COVID-19 vaccines recommendations. My name is Alexandra Wierzbowski and I am with the National Collaborating Center for Infectious Diseases. NCCID is funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada to provide knowledge and evidence for use in public health planning and policy and is supporting the agency with, with knowledge translation during the COVID-19 response. I would like to acknowledge that NCCID is located at the University of Manitoba on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Speakers and hosts will use the chat tab for extra communication to attendees if need be, so please keep an eye on that tab as well. The recording of this webinar and presentation slides will be available shortly after the webinar at, at nccid.ca. Now I would like to introduce the moderator for today's webinar, Dr. April Kelly Kelly. Dr. Kelly Kelly is an acting manager for the Healthcare Provider Webinar Program at the Public Health Agency of Canada. Welcome, Dr. Kelly Kelly. Thanks, Alexandra, and it's a pleasure to welcome everyone today to um, this, uh, this webinar and this really exciting topic. Um, we have Drs. Jesse Pappenberg, Robin Harrison, Brian Orszowski, Austin Nam, and Beate Sander as your presenters today. Dr. Jesse Pappenberg is an assistant professor of pediatrics and associate member of the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Health at McGill University. Dr. Pappenberg is a voting member of the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, NACI, um, which develops vaccine recommendations in Canada. Dr. Robin Harrison is a clinical professor at the University of Alberta in the Department of Medicine, Division of Infectious Diseases. Dr. Harrison is a member of the High Consequence Infectious Disease Working Group, Chair of the Influenza Working Group, group and voting member of NACI. Dr. Brian Ruszowski is a medical advisor with the Center for Immunization and Respiratory Infectious Diseases at the Public Health Agency of Canada. Dr. Beate Sander is a Canadian Research Chair in Economics of Infectious Diseases, uh, Scientist and Director of the Population Health Economics Research at University Health Network um, and University Health Network. I'm sorry. She is Acting Director for the Toronto Health Economics and Technology Assessment Collaborative and is Associate Professor and Faculty Co-Lead um, Health Technology Assessment Program at the University of Toronto. Dr. Austin Nam is a Senior Health Economist with NACI um, at the Public Health Agency of Canada. So let's go to our next slide. So um, uh, these are the declarations of interest for each of the speakers. And let's get right into the presentation. Oh, I'm sorry. So this is the outline. So we're gonna give an overview of NACI. We're gonna look at the um, an overview of efficacy and effectiveness. We're going to talk about the um, impact of the vaccine via modeling. And then we're gonna talk about um, the NACI recommendations. Yeah, so over to you, Dr. Pappenberg. Thanks so much, April. So I think it's important to, to understand the context and that the goal of Canada's pandemic response is to minimize serious illness and death while minimizing societal disruption uh, as a result of COVID-19. And I think we could all agree that COVID-19 vaccines are gonna play a huge role uh, for us to achieve this. Um, and I think it's also important to note that Canada has a very robust, rigorous, dependable and highly proven vaccine approval system. So NACI uh, provides guidance to the provinces and territories for the use of COVID-19 vaccines. And this has been particularly uh, important in the context of uh, limited supply, especially early on in the vaccine rollout. Next slide. So just to take a look at uh, how a product uh, gets used in terms of vaccines in Canada. Well, first, Health Canada authorizes health products for use in Canada based on safety, efficacy, immunogenicity, quality data, and continues to regulate these products after authorization. Now, NACI makes recommendation on the use of these authorized vaccines, also based on safety and efficacy evidence, but also on disease epidemiology, global effectiveness data, and population needs within Canada. <clears throat> 
And finally, the provinces and territories uh, determine how they implement these vaccines through their publicly funded vaccination programs. Next slide. Again, contrasting the role of Health Canada and NACI a little bit, the role of the regulator is to authorize uh, specific indications for use, uh, again, based on safety, immunogenicity, efficacy data, and the quality of the product. Uh, but the focus is really on the individual. So risks and benefits of the vaccines are assessed for the individual. In contrast, NACI makes recommendations uh, for the optimal use of the product, but within the context of public health programs and population health, and as well taking into consideration the risks and benefits for the individual. So the benefits of the vaccine for public health programs and the health needs within specific populations are also assessed by NACI within this, this context. And finally, both organizations will review preclinical and clinical data uh, submitted by manufacturers, post-marketing monitoring data, and NACI will take all of this information as well, but also, it, again, in the context of public health considerations, including other existing vaccine products or vaccine programs and schedules and disease epidemiology. Next slide. So NACI is an external advisory board to the Public Health Agency of Canada that develops evidence-based advice on vaccines approved for use in Canada. And it's comprised of experts in various fields that are important to make these types of recommendations. Uh, NACI to, NACI's advice is published at, in the public, uh, to the public in the form of statements. And these statements are synthesized in the Canadian Immunization Guide. And these statements and the CIG can be found on the web. Next slide, please. So with regards to COVID-19 vaccines, in December 2020, the first vaccines were approved for use in Canada. And shortly thereafter, NACI began providing evidence-based guidelines on their use, including recommendations on the intervals between uh, doses of vaccines. In January, NACI provided initial advice on dosing intervals, recommending extending intervals up to six weeks. And in February, NACI was asked to address uh, intervals in jurisdictions with supply and logistical challenges. And in March, provided a rapid response statement with regards to these intervals. And in April, a full advisory committee statement was published and that explained the rationale for the recommendations. Next slide. So now NACI did this, uh, these recommendations were born from discussions uh, that were uh, um, performed during full committee meetings that reviewed evidence from all available sources, including peer reviewed studies, preprints and cohort studies. Next slide. Considerations that were taken into account when looking at these extended interval decisions were efficacy and effectiveness of the first dose, duration of protection of the first dose, impact of extending the interval between the priming and boosting doses on the immune, immune response and vaccine efficacy, uh, the impact of more rapidly vaccinating a greater number of people, the impact on variants of concern, impact on specific population groups, modeling information, as well as the framework of ethics, equity, feasibility, and acceptability of extending the interval. Next slide. And I'll hand it over to Dr. Bryna Warshowski, who's gonna be talking about the efficacy and effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines and the impact on transmission. Thanks very much, Jesse. Um, so um, as Jesse mentioned, I'm gonna talk about efficacy and effectiveness and a little bit about transmission. Um, so just to start off with some terminology, um, as people likely know, but just to review, efficacy is how well a vaccine works in a clinical trial. So in that very controlled setting of a clinical trial, we, we speak of efficacy. Effectiveness is how well a vaccine works in the real world in observational studies uh, based on programs that are happening around the world. And immunogenicity is the term used for the body's immune response to the vaccine. So we'll refer to humoral or B cell immunity and also cellular or T cell immunity. The challenge with immunogenicity studies with regard to COVID-19 vaccines is of course, we don't have a correlative protection. So we don't know how much of an immune response equals actual protection from disease. So, but that's something that we are uh, learning as more and more information becomes available. So next slide, please. So first, we're going to start with the efficacy studies, and we're going to, um, of course, look at some of the published clinical trials. So on the next slide, you'll see some of the results from the clinical trials. And we show um, the, the trials here, but uh, 
one thing to note is that you can't directly compare one trial to the other because these are not head-to-head -head trials. These are individual trials presenting their efficacy data. So as everybody knows, the two mRNA vaccines, Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna, their efficacy based on two doses for symptomatic disease is between 94 and 95 percent. For the AstraZeneca um, trials, there's a number of um, efficacy estimates in the study that looked at results from the UK, Brazil, and South Africa combined. Based on uh, two standard doses, the efficacy was 63%. However, that trial also noted that if you extend the interval between the first and second dose to 12 weeks or more, the efficacy increased to 81%. And as well, there has been a recent press release based on data from the United States for AstraZeneca. And this was a trial that looked at a four-week interval between doses. And here they noted an efficacy of 76%. Next slide, please. So on the next slide, we're going to look at um, the efficacy of um, one dose based on for symptomatic disease based on the clinical trials. So for the two mRNA vaccines, what we have is efficacy from 14 days after the first dose was given up until the time the second dose was given. These studies were not intended to look at one dose efficacy, but there is a period of time between when we know the vaccine will start to work at around 14 days up until the time the second dose was given. And for the Pfizer vaccine, that's only about a one week period because we give the second dose at 21 days as per the manufacturer's um, recommendations. Um, and in the clinical trials, the second dose was given for Moderna at 28 days. So that only leaves a two week period between the 14 days after the vaccine is expected to work and when the second dose is given. But in that one to two week interval, um, there was an efficacy noted of 92%. So I don't think that was a particularly expected um, benefit, but in the trials for the short period between when the vaccine works and the second dose is given, both uh, clinical trials showed a one dose efficacy of 92%. And that was really the basis of what started us thinking about this extended interval is that possibly the one dose was showing good efficacy um, for, for after just that one dose. The AstraZeneca trial, they did actually have um, a varying interval between the first and second dose because of the way their trial was implemented. And so they were able to show that from 22 days out to 90 days after the first dose, they were uh, showing an efficacy of about 76%. And of course, the Janssen vaccine is a single dose vaccine. And if they looked at their clinical trial starting at 28 days or more, they showed an efficacy of 66% against uh, symptomatic disease. Now, the next slide will look at um, asymptomatic disease or asymptomatic infection. Again, there isn't a lot of information in the clinical trials about um, asymptomatic infection. However, for the Moderna trial, they did swab people originally with the first dose. And again, when people um, appeared for their second dose at 28 days later. And based on that, uh, those swab informations in people who were not reporting symptoms, they were able to show um, preliminarily a 61% reduction in asymptomatic infection. Now, this covers the whole 28-day period between the first and second dose. And as we know, the vaccine isn't likely to work in those first 14 days. So likely this estimate would be higher if you could remove the first 14 days when there's no effect from the vaccine. But of course, we can't do that with the information that we have. In the AstraZeneca trial, they actually swabbed people in the UK part of the, the trial on a weekly basis and reported on people who either said they had didn't report any symptoms or, or it was unknown whether they had any symptoms. And here they didn't see um, efficacy against asymptomatic infection. But when they looked more closely at the data, they did actually were able to suggest that there is some efficacy against asymptomatic infection if you look at the non-B117 strains. So looking at B117, there was lower um, efficacy against asymptomatic, but in the non-B117 strains that were circulating for part of the, the trial, they actually did see better efficacy against asymptomatic infection. And in the Janssen trial, what they did is they drew blood for serology to look at the nucleocapsid protein. Um, and this would be a protein that doesn't come from the vaccine, but would come from infection. And they were able to determine the protection from um, serological conversion in the vaccinated compared to the unvaccinated at day 71. And here they found a 66% efficacy against asymptomatic infection. So very similar to what they showed for symptomatic infection. Now I don't have here um, 
in the slides, but the studies did also look at uh, more severe disease. Now in the trials, there weren't, in some of the trials, there weren't a lot of people with severe disease, but generally um, all of the vaccines that looked at severe disease were showing very good effectiveness against severe um, outcomes for, for all the, the various vaccines. Okay, next slide, please. There are, is also some efficacy data against variants of concern. Um, not a lot, but there's some. So for Pfizer, BioNTech, there was a press release that came out looking at a small study in South Africa of 800 people. Um, here, there were nine cases who tested positive. They were all in the placebo group, giving 100% efficacy. And of those, six were the B1351 variant, suggesting protection of the Pfizer vaccine against that variant. Again, this is a small study. For AstraZeneca, there is a published study that looked at um, efficacy in South Africa, where the B1351 variant is circulating. This was about 2,000 participants, and they showed only 10.4% efficacy against that variant in, uh, in South Africa. And for the Janssen uh, single dose uh, study, there, the overall efficacy was 66%, uh, similar in the United States, also similar in Brazil, where at the time the P2 variant was dominating, and so they saw 68% efficacy there. And um, in South Africa, where the B1351 variant is uh, predominating, there was 64% efficacy, so very similar to the overall efficacy. So we'll now switch to looking at effectiveness studies based on real-world observational data. So on the next slide, please. So um, this has been a bit of a challenge in that studies are being pub well, released all the time. And many of these studies are actually preprints when they first come out. And of course, those have not been peer reviewed. So um, have a variety of good quality and, and, and studies that um, may not go on to publication um, included as well. The effectiveness data is, of course, based on the programs that are being implemented in the various countries at the time. So at NASI, we were particularly interested in looking at one dose effectiveness to inform our extended interval. And this, um, this data will depend um, on the country that the uh, one dose effectiveness is being studied in. So as an example, in Israel and the United States, they used um, the schedule very similar to what the manufacturers recommended. So they gave their second dose very shortly within 21 uh, to 28 days after the first dose. So there's a very short interval there to actually assess the impact of the first dose, mainly that one to two weeks beyond the 14 days after it starts to work. So you don't get the full impact of the uh, first dose based on those studies because very shortly thereafter you're giving a second dose. Whereas in the countries where they have actually implemented an extended interval, such as the United Kingdom and here in Canada, we do get a better sense of how the one dose um, efficacy will work because there is a, a longer period of time to follow the impact of that single dose. Now, this, the effectiveness studies look at a range of outcomes. Some look at symptomatic disease, some asymptomatic infection. Many of them look at this combined outcome of PCR positivity. So they, they can't distinguish whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic disease. It's, it's the two of them combined, and that's a lot of the, uh, the study outcomes. Some look at hospitalizations, some deaths, and also some more recently have looked at transmission, and we'll talk a little bit about those studies as well. Next slide, please. So here's um, just a, a quick overview of some of the designs that are used in these, um, it says efficacy study designs, sorry, it should say effectiveness study designs. So in the effectiveness studies, here are some of the uh, designs that were used. Some of them uh, used linked administrative data. So here they have um, records of people's immunization, and they also have records of people's laboratory tests, and they're able to link those together. Um, some also have patients past medical history so that they can get an underlying um, sense of who are in the vaccinated and unvaccinated groups or the positive and um, not positive groups to figure out how comparable they are. So sometimes they use cohorts where they, they look at the vaccinated and unvaccinated people, follow them either forward or um, backwards based on person years of vaccination, looking at the rates of positive um, SARS-CoV in the vaccinated and unvaccinated groups. Some match the vaccinated and unvaccinated groups and then again follow them for uh, test positivity. Um, again, looking at the rates of positivity in the unvaccinated and the vaccinated and comparing those. 
Some effectiveness designs will use test negative designs. And here what they do is look at uh, people who come in for testing for SARS-CoV-2 and looking at those who test positive and those who test negative and comparing the immunization rates among those who are um, positive and those who are negative. And this is a method that allows you to determine, determine vaccine effectiveness, which we use often for our influenza vaccine effectiveness studies. And there are also some effectiveness designs that follow cohorts uh, going forward uh, to look at and, and screen them on a regular basis. These are often healthcare workers, so they will know who's vaccinated, they'll know who's not vaccinated, and they will screen them and figure out the, uh, the percentage that tests positive in the vaccinated and unvaccinated groups. The study populations depend in effectiveness data on who um, is being offered vaccine in the various countries. So often it will be healthcare workers, some of whom as mentioned, are regularly screened, can also be long-term care residents because they were offered vaccine fairly early and sometimes it looks at them during outbreak scenarios. Older adults were also offered vaccine early, subsequently the general population, and also studies that look at hospitalized populations. Next slide, please. So here's a summary of the effectiveness data results. So for AstraZeneca, for one dose, um, looking at symptomatic and asymptomatic disease, we're looking at an effectiveness about 58 to 68%. And there is a study that looks at asymptomatic infection in here as well. And that does show um, that we are seeing some effectiveness with the AstraZeneca vaccine against asymptomatic infection. The effectiveness against hospitalization is higher at around 80%. For two doses of AstraZeneca, there's, um, as far as I'm aware of, no effectiveness data yet. And we do expect that though to come, uh, particularly from the UK and, and potentially also from Canada and other countries as they begin to offer the second dose of AstraZeneca. For Janssen, uh, there wasn't any effectiveness data, although last night there was a trial uh, uh, observational study that came out of the Mayo Clinic, which showed a 77% effectiveness 14 days or more after that single dose. For the mRNA one dose vaccines uh, for symptomatic and asymptomatic disease, the generally there's a number of studies that looked at this and they're seeing generally about 60 to 80% um, effectiveness from that single dose. There were some studies with some higher estimates and some lower, but generally around um, 60, 70% effectiveness. Higher for hospitalizations, around 80%, and for deaths, around 85%. Now, these are all estimates, and there are some ranges within the studies, but these are the general parameters. For the mRNA for two doses, they are seeing very good effectiveness, um, very similar to the clinical trials for symptomatic and asymptomatic disease, between 90 and 95%, and similarly for hospitalizations and deaths, between 93 and 96% effectiveness. So on the next slide, um, so now I'll just show the, the data that you've just seen all sort of packaged together. So you can compare uh, for each vaccine, its effect, efficacy and effectiveness based on one and two doses. So on the next slide, this looks at the AstraZeneca. So um, basically you're seeing that for one and two doses of AstraZeneca, both for um, efficacy and effectiveness, we're seeing very similar results. So the two dose efficacy was between 63 and 76%, depending on what uh, publication you're looking at. For one dose efficacy, it was about 76%. And for one dose effectiveness in that same range between 58 and 68%. So basically similar data, one dose, two doses, um, and for the one dose between the efficacy and the effectiveness. For the Janssen, the single dose efficacy, as we mentioned, was 66. And then the subsequent trial um, or study that came out last night showing 77% effectiveness. So very similar as well. On the next slide, um, we will see the uh, mRNA results. So as we know from the clinical trials, uh, two dose efficacy against symptomatic disease, 94 to 95%, and very similar effectiveness for two doses based on looking at uh, the studies that look at symptomatic and asymptomatic disease, um, 90 to 95% effectiveness, so very similar to the efficacy. The one dose efficacy, as we mentioned, 92%. Um, and, but again, this was based on that very short interval from 14 days after the first dose until the second dose was given. The one dose effectiveness is a bit lower than what we're seeing in the efficacy trials, somewhere between 60 to 80% with some higher and lower estimates when you go 14 days or more after vaccination. So on the next slide, we'll explore here a bit why the effectiveness data 
for the one dose mRNA may be a bit lower um, than we're seeing in the efficacy data. First of all, these are observational studies from which we derive the effectiveness data. And we know that um, in general, um, we see lower um, impacts from effectiveness data versus efficacy trials. And part of that may be because we don't include exactly the same study populations. So as an example, in the observational studies, we're often uh, some of the the populations included would be older adults in long-term care facilities that are quite frail, and those populations are generally excluded from efficacy trials. As well, the effectiveness data is looking often both at symptomatic and asymptomatic infection combined, whereas in the clinical trial data, it was mainly the symptomatic um, infection or disease that was being looked at. And we know that sometimes you can have somewhat lower impact against asymptomatic infection, which may impact the uh, effectiveness estimates. As well, when get vaccinated with their first dose, it may be that they change their behavior, particularly in the real world, and put them some more at risk for exposure because they know they've had their first dose. And we don't recommend doing this at all. We recommend continuing to follow all the public health advice. But that may be um, what's impacting the, uh, the one dose effectiveness data a bit is that uh, people are changing their behavior, whereas we say really should be continuing to follow all the public health advice. Um, and as well, we know that um, in the effectiveness data, there may be an impact that we're seeing from the B117 uh, variant that was more predominant in some of the effectiveness data when the one dose effectiveness was being collected versus when the clinical trials were being conducted. As well, there are methodological issues that we know about with the effectiveness um, data. Uh, some of it was because it was only for that short period between the first and second dose. Some of it depends on the dates that people chose to use for the effectiveness data. And some of it depends a bit on what's happening in the community. So there are a number of methodological considerations at, at when we're looking at effectiveness data. Okay, on the next slide, please. So now we're going to use that to see what it means in terms of uh, transmission. So in essence, if you can prevent symptomatic PCR confirmed uh, disease and also PCR confirmed asymptomatic infection, that is um, how much at least you will prevent for transmission. So if you're not getting symptomatic disease, you're not getting asymptomatic infection, then you can't transmit um, infection because you, you never acquire the virus. So that's the minimum amount of uh, impact we should expect on transmission is the impact we have on asymptomatic and symptomatic uh, disease and infection. But additionally, we may get higher um, impact than that on transmission because we know that some people who are vaccinated but get infected nonetheless, which we call breakthrough infection, it's possible that these people will be less infectious than somebody who is unvaccinated because potentially the vaccine has an impact on decreasing their viral load, their shedding, and potentially the duration for which they shed. So on the next slide, we just summarize here, what you've seen before is the impact of the various um, vaccines on symptomatic and asymptomatic infection, because as mentioned, this is um, at least how much impact you will have on transmission. So for the mRNAs at two doses, between 90 and 95% effective um, for asymptomatic and symptomatic uh, disease. And that means that that minimum amount of prevention for transmission. One dose, 60 to 80% effective against symptomatic and asymptomatic disease. So that minimum amount um, of impact on transmission. And for AstraZeneca, 63 to 70% against symptomatic disease. We're not totally sure about asymptomatic, but it could be um, fairly similar as well. So it will have that level of impact, at least on transmission. And Janssen, 66% uh, impact um, on transmission for sure at minimum. There are some studies that also show that when uh, people who have breakthrough disease, so get infected despite being vaccinated, they tend to have a, vi a lower viral load which suggests that there may also be an impact on transmission, even if they become infected. And on the next slide, there are two recent studies that have actually looked at the impact of vaccination on transmission. There is one that was done in Scotland looking at record linkage that showed that vaccinated healthcare workers um, were less likely to have transmission within their household compared to unvaccinated healthcare workers. The, the issue with this study is it didn't distinguish whether that was because the healthcare worker themselves was less likely to become infected, therefore less likely to bring infection 
into their household, or whether this was because the vaccinated healthcare worker, when they got infected, were less likely to transmit within their household. However, a, a more recent study did actually look at that very question. So this was a study looking at record linkages in England, um, mostly among people who had received one dose of either the Pfizer vaccine or, or the AstraZeneca vaccine. And here what they did is they looked at people who tested positive. So these were people who were positive for SARS-CoV-2, some of whom were vaccinated and some of whom were not vaccinated. And what they found is the people who tested positive um, who were vaccinated were less likely to transmit infection in their household compared to the people who tested positive but were unvaccinated. So basically they were showing that in households um, where the person who was infected was vaccinated, there was a 40 to 50% lower chance of transmission within their household compared to where the um, person who tested positive was not vaccinated. So showing that even if you get breakthrough disease, those people are likely to be less infectious if they're vaccinated. So all this together showing that the vaccines will have an impact on transmission, which is something that we did not know when we started out on this, uh, this venture. Okay, so on the next slides, I'm just going to try to come back to um, the slides that Jesse mentioned with regard to the considerations that NASI looked at um, for their extended interval uh, decisions. So the next slide is the, uh, the slide that Jesse showed about those considerations. And I'll just walk through um, the first few of them. So on the next slide, you'll see that, um, so the next slide shows the summary of the efficacy and effectiveness data that we've looked at. So basically uh, for one dose, the first dose in a two dose series, the effectiveness is about 60 to 80% with uh, somewhat lower and somewhat higher estimates. But, but we know that for hospitalizations, the effectiveness was even higher at about 80%. So that's the foundation for going forward with the extended dose strategy is that you get good protection from that first dose. Now, the other consideration is how long does the protection from that first dose last? We do have some Canadian data that shows that um, in some individuals, there's protection up to about 12 weeks. And from the UK, information from um, at least up to eight weeks as well. So showing that there is, um, that it does last at least that long. We do know from the AstraZeneca trials where they actually modeled up to 90 days of efficacy in their clinical trials. So it did work um, that one dose up to at least 90 days. And we know from other vaccines that um, a single dose can protect up to at least six months or longer. And this is a space that we continue to monitor on an ongoing basis to make sure that we are not seeing a waning or decrease in immunity. Now, the next thing that NASI looked at, and this is a very important point is Oops, um, whether we would see um, when you extend the interval, so when you give that second dose later after the first dose, will you see um, as good a response from that second dose if it's delayed from the time that you gave the first dose? And here what NASI looked at is the principles of vaccinology. We know from many vaccines um, in the past that when you extend the interval between the first and second dose, you actually um, often get a better immune response than if the interval is shorter. So what we know is when you give that first dose, what you're trying to induce is a memory response so our, that our B cells develop a memory response to that first antigen that we've seen. And we know that it takes time for that memory response to develop and mature. And then if you give that second dose after you have allowed that time for the B cell memory response to develop and mature, you often get a much higher immune response for that second dose if the interval is delayed between that first and second dose. So you, you boost on a more mature immune response and get a higher and more durable and long lasting immune response. Um, and actually the AstraZeneca trial showed that. They showed that you get better efficacy if you delay the interval between the first and second dose by 12 weeks or more. So we have heard of some, some people thinking that, oh, I'll wait um, to get my first dose so it can be closer to my second dose. But in fact, that, um, that strategy is, is counterproductive because for two reasons. One, in that you're not getting the, the good solid efficacy we know that you will get from the first dose if you get that first dose um, you know, as it becomes available to you. And also we know that if you extend the interval longer than the manufacturer's recommendations, it's likely that when you get that second dose, 
um, at a little somewhat longer of an interval, you will get at least as good, if not a better immune response, which is likely to potentially last longer as well. So that's another principle of vaccinology that NASI used to extend the interval between the first and second dose. On the next slide, um, we can see that the main reason that NASI chose for extending the interval between the first and second dose was to vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible. And we knew um, and now know with our available supply of vaccines that we'll be able to offer all eligible individuals their first dose by early to mid June, and then be able to go back as quickly as possible after that to offer a second dose. So although NASI recommended an interval of up to 12, uh, up to 16 weeks to uh, for between the first and second dose, because of the supply of vaccine that we have, many people will not need to wait anywhere near that long and will be able to go back and offer the second dose very quickly after the first dose is offered. Uh, so by mid to early June, we should be able to be going back to offering second doses and we have enough supply to offer second doses to everybody by around early to mid August. And this faster protection allows direct protections for, for the individual to be protected, but we also know that that means that that individual is now less transmissible to those around them, so there's indirect protection. And if we can vaccinate large enough people, uh, numbers of people fast enough, we may also be able to impact the herd effect or decrease the transmission in our communities as well. Now, the other thing that, that NASI considered is the impact on variants of concern. And um, we know that uh, we don't know exactly the impact on variants of concern, but we have seen some recent uh, studies that suggest that if you decrease transmission in the community, you will also decrease the emergence of variants of concern. And so um, that was considered in NASI's deliberations. And as well, we looked at the impact impact on specific population groups, such as older individuals and individuals with underlying medical conditions. There isn't um, effectiveness data or efficacy data for this group. There is some immunogenicity data that does show that this group may have a lower immune response in some studies, uh, but there is, as we said, no correlate of protection as to how well this uh, means that the vaccine works. However, these are groups that we're watching closely and groups that when we are able to offer second dose will be first in line to offer that second dose as quickly as possible. So with that, I will now turn uh, the floor over to uh, Dr. Austin Nam to speak about uh, modeling. And then subsequently, uh, Dr. Robin Harrison will speak about some ethics and equity and feasibility implications. Thank you. Thank you, Bryna. Um, so before we get into the modeling, it's, I, I just want to point out that uh, when we talk about the modeling, we are talking about this in the context of constrained vaccine supply, which is the situation we have been facing um, over, over this uh, early part of 2021. And, and the reason why uh, the constrained vaccine supply matters is because having constrained supply limits the, the rate of vaccine uptake. Um, and, and it limits the, the rate at which we can get protection uh, into, the, into the population. And further to that, a two-dose regimen uh, with a short interval also limits uh, how quickly we can get that initial protection into the population. Uh, and this is particularly um, true when uh, the, the vaccine supply is constrained. So extending the interval is, is a temporary measure to decrease the burden of disease as quickly as possible. Uh, and based on the expected supplies of mRNA vaccines, as Brian had uh, just mentioned, we, we believe we can get uh, up to about 90% of people aged 50, 50 and older and 75% of those 16 to 49 years uh, vaccinated with one dose by mid-June. So given that, um, an extended interval allows us to consider um, the ability to provide protection to many people uh, with one dose versus um, providing protection with two doses to fewer people if we use a, a standard six-week interval. And this is the context in which we are considering uh, the modeling. So we use an age stratified compartmental model to examine the impact of uh, accelerating vaccine coverage with extended intervals of 12, 16, and 24 weeks. And we compared this to a six week interval. And we used a six week interval uh, because this was the interval being used across the country at the time of the NASI recommendations on extended intervals. Also note here that this model does not include long-term care residents. 
in this model, we look at vaccine effectiveness values that were uh, taken from a range of likely values that are based off of real world effectiveness estimates. And then we search for conditions that might result in uh, extended intervals being less beneficial by looking at a wider range of first dose effectiveness, uh, particularly against hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, and in addition, we also looked at short durations of protection, uh, ranging from three to six months, to examine uh, waning protection, uh, waning protection after the first dose. A few key assumptions to be aware of. Uh, we assume that vaccines would be prioritized in descending order of age until age 55 and then offered in no particular order to those aged 20 to 54 years of age. We assume the vaccine coverage of 65% in those aged 20 to 64 and 80% in those aged 65 and older. And these are based on uh, vaccine acceptability surveys from mid to late 2020. Further assumed a daily vaccination capacity of 150,000 doses per day in the first quarter, uh, which increased to 350,000 per day in April, 450,000 in May, and 525,000 in June onward. And these are based on uh, feedback from the provinces and territories that we then aggregated to create a national picture of vaccination capacity. It's important to note here that the daily vaccination capacity here is an assumption of the just a maximum vaccination capacity it does not include vaccine supply, which is the other element of vaccine uptake. So we then incorporate an explicit supply schedule based on what was known at the time of the recommendations about vaccine supply entering the country. So the vaccine uptake cannot exceed either the daily vaccination capacity or the available supply in country. And finally, we simulated a third wave that began on April 1st, 2021. And the details of all this modeling that uh, we're about to show you are available publicly as a preprint at the link below. And I'll further note here that the, uh, the results that we're going to show you are, are the results that we showed uh, to NACI at the time of these recommendations. Uh, so the model continues to evolve, but we are showing you the, the analysis that was done at that time. So this table shows the vaccine effectiveness assumptions that we used in the model. And you can see that we delineate or we distinguish uh, the effectiveness against acquiring infection in the first place, uh, effectiveness against developing symptomatic disease, effectiveness uh, against developing severe disease resulting in hospitalization, and effectiveness against death. And we further delineate the effectiveness assumptions uh, by dose one and dose two. And so the dose one effectiveness uh, estimates are based on uh, estimates coming out of the United Kingdom where a 12 week interval uh, is currently being used. And uh, the dose two effectiveness estimates are based on uh, estimates from Israel where uh, greater than 50% of the population uh, had received both doses uh, at the time of this analysis. So the central column or the middle column there represents the likely values in our assumptions that are taken from the range in the far right hand column. Uh, and so we sample uh, values from these ranges and these the likely values are, are coming from that range. And so the likely values represent uh, our base case. Now I'll highlight one other thing here, which is the uh, effectiveness of the infection, which is in that first row. And here's where we have uh, a little bit more uncertainty as to what the values of the uh, of this estimate should be. Uh, so we use two scenarios here. So what, the first is uh, where we assume that the effectiveness against infection is 90% relative to the effectiveness against symptomatic disease. So for example, if the effectiveness against symptomatic disease is 50%, then the effectiveness against infection under the scenario is 45%. Uh, then we also look at a conservative scenario where we assume the effectiveness against infection is 50% relative to uh, effectiveness against disease. So the, the analysis that we're going to show you in the forthcoming slides uh, will all represent the first scenario uh, where effectiveness against infection is 90% relative to um, effectiveness against disease. So the conservative scenario is available in the preprint, uh, and, and I'll tell you that um, Largely, these come to the same conclusion uh, as the uh, effectiveness against infection being 90% relative to disease. So this slide shows our main base case uh, results, uh, and this is showing the relative benefits of the extended intervals um, in reducing symptomatic disease, hospitalizations, and deaths over a 12-month time horizon. And this is all relative to a six-week interval. So. The higher the benefit or the, the more reductions in symptomatic disease, hospitalizations, and deaths, uh, the better. 
Uh, so the green bar represents a 12-week interval, the blue bar represents a 16-week interval, and, a 20, and uh, the purple bar represents a 24-week interval. Uh, and we can see as the interval gets longer, we see uh, greater benefits in reducing symptomatic disease, hospitalizations, and deaths. And these are average, uh, re uh, average benefits uh, across 2,000 sample effectiveness values. So this slide shows the exact same result, uh, but now we stratify it by age. Uh, and again, as the interval gets longer, so as you move from a green to a blue to a purple bar, so which is 12 to 16 to 24 weeks, uh, the benefits in reducing symptomatic disease, hospitalizations, and deaths also increases. And there, now there are two exceptions to this. Uh, and so the first, uh, if you'll direct your attention to the far left panel, which is the benefit in reducing symptomatic disease, the far, the right-hand grouping, which is the 75 and older uh, group, uh, shows that uh, the 16 and 24 week, which is the blue and purple bar, are actually falling below zero. So we're seeing a negative benefit or a negative reduction, which is really saying uh, we're projecting an increase in symptomatic disease in this age group. Now, this is mainly mild, uh, this is really mild and moderate disease that we are projecting uh, an increase in. Um, because if you direct your attention to the center panel, which is the reduction in hospitalizations, uh, hospitalizations are really a proxy for severe disease in our model. And across all intervals, we see a positive benefit. So we're projecting um, greater reductions in hospitalizations. So really, that symptomatic disease, that increase in symptomatic disease is mild and moderate in 75 and older. Now, we do also notice that in the, in the benefits in reducing hospitalization, so that center panel, that the purple bar in the 75 and older group is, is lower than the green and blue bar. So um, the 24-week interval, the long interval, does not result in the largest reductions in hospitalizations. Uh, and then even if we look at deaths, uh, which is the far right panel, the 24-week interval, which is the purple bar, is quite close to the 16-week interval. So in in this final age group, in this older, oldest age, uh, the longest interval does not necessarily translate to the, the greatest benefit. So in this slide, uh, we are now looking at a wider range of dose one effectiveness against hospitalizations and dose one effectiveness against death. So a much wider range than what we looked at in our base case. So in the left-hand panel, this is again showing the benefits in reducing hospitalizations over a range of dose one effectiveness against hospitalizations from 50 to 85 percent. Across all of the, this entire range for all intervals, we still project uh, a, a, a positive benefit or a benefit in reducing hospitalizations. As we might expect, uh, the effectiveness against hospitalizations decreases, so too does the relative benefit of extending the interval, but we still remain, um, we still project uh, a, a larger reduction in hospitalization compared to a six-week interval. However, if we look at uh, effectiveness against death, we now start to see some sensitivity uh, of the extended interval strategy to, to this parameter. So as the dose one effectiveness against death starts to fall below 65%, uh, we start to see a negative benefit. So we start projecting an increase in death uh, as the dose one effectiveness gets smaller, uh, gets uh, falls below 55%. The other thing we'll, we'll note here is that uh, as you move from right to left, so from a higher effectiveness to a lower effectiveness, the longer interval is actually more sensitive. So what I mean by that is the purple bar decreases faster than the blue and green bars. So a 24-week interval, the benefit of a 24-week interval decreases faster than a 16 or 12-week interval. And conversely, the 16-week uh, interval also decreases faster than the 12-week interval. So the longer the interval, the more sensitive it is to the dose one effectiveness. Now here we look at uh, the relative benefits of the standard intervals when the duration of protection after the first dose is three months or six months. Uh, and generally speaking, the benefits of these standard intervals are fairly robust to, to these durations of protection. Uh, one potential exception here is the 24-week interval uh, when the duration of protection is three months. Uh, the relative benefits in, in preventing deaths, which is the bottom left panel, uh, is approaching close to zero. Uh, so here we're starting to see some sensitivity of that uh, long interval, that long 24-week interval to a short duration of protection. 
So there are some limitations to this model. Uh, this model represents population level effects, and so it does not account for subgroups who might have lower protection from the first dose. Uh, in our simulated third wave, we did not include additional public health responses over those that uh, were already in place. Uh, so in a way, this represents a type of worst case epidemic scenario. Uh, and in turn, it represents uh, a best case for showcasing the vaccination benefit. Uh, we did also look at milder third wave scenarios. And these also projected reductions in symptomatic disease, hospitalizations, and deaths. Uh, but of course, as the third wave becomes milder and milder, the relative benefits start to decrease. Uh, and these are also in the in the preprint on the link in the in the earlier slides. Uh, we did not model uh, variants of concern explicitly. Uh, however, you could look at the third wave scenario as a proxy for severe resur resurgence under VOCs, and you could also look at the sensitivity analysis uh, to consider how potentially reduced effectiveness under VOCs can affect the extended interval strategy. Uh, but one thing that is not in here is um, increased virulence uh, under VOCs. So that is one limitation here. Uh, and finally, we did not model transmission in healthcare settings, and we also did not consider hospital capacity uh, in our model. Uh, and that last point uh, with respect to hospital capacity has some bearing on the third wave, where you know, an extreme third wave likely results in exceeding hospital capacity. So in this case, we, we may be underestimating uh, the projected deaths. Um, um, uh, when not considering hospital capacity in the model. Overall, uh, at current real-world effectiveness estimates, uh, the extended intervals are projected to reduce uh, overall if symptomatic disease, hospitalizations, and deaths when vaccine supply is limited. Uh, sensitivity analysis suggests that the first dose effectiveness against death is an important outcome to monitor. Uh, waning protection can be uh, an important outcome to monitor, and it needs to be somewhat rapid uh, for aesthetic intervals to become a core strategy. But generally speaking, the longer the interval, uh, the, the greater the reduction in hospitalizations and deaths. Um, but the, the rate of that reduction will, uh, starts to decrease um, as the interval gets longer. And what I mean by that is the, the relative benefit of a 24-week interval compared to a 16-week interval is not as great as a 16-week interval compared to a 12-week interval. So um, as we extend that interval further and further, we start to run into the uh, vaccination capacity and the supplies. So it doesn't really matter how long you extend the interval, you can never really vaccinate faster than the available capacity or the available supply. Uh, and in addition, we already prioritize older individuals who have the most to gain in terms of how to reduce hospitalizations and deaths um, with shorter intervals. Uh, the benefits of the extended intervals are primarily due to accelerating partial protection in adults aged 20 to 74 years. And if we take a step back and think about the overall behavior that the model is showing us, uh, the extended intervals provide a strategy for reducing overall incidence of serious outcomes, uh, especially when there is an expectation of increasing risk of infection in serious outcomes in the near term, uh, particularly when vaccine supply is constrained. And that was the situation we were facing at the time of these recommendations. Um, also highlight here that this model is not a prediction of what the optimal interval is. Um, the, the, the optimal interval to obtain a fair balance between short-term and long-term protection is, is really unknown. So that was the analysis that was conducted internally with a, with a model, uh, an internal model by SAC. Uh, but at, that, at the time of these recommendations, there were a few other modeling studies that were available either in publication or in preprint. Uh, and these models also looked at various delay intervals or in some cases a single dose strategy. And generally speaking, these models also found that uh, interval extension uh, can also reduce infections, hospitalizations, and deaths compared to uh, using a standard interval uh, when supply is limited. Uh, and again, these, these benefits are conferred by providing greater vaccine coverage to more people, even though protection with a single dose uh, is lower than, than two doses. Uh, again, in these in these studies, the single dose effectiveness is, is fairly important. Um, however, these studies are gen were at the time looking at um, first dose effectiveness against disease as a proxy for effectiveness against the more serious outcomes as well, so hospitalizations and deaths. And, and so, in our model, we were able to parse these out uh, as our, our modeling analysis was conducted at a time when uh, real world effectiveness estimates against hospitalizations and deaths became available. Uh, but generally speaking, 
uh, both the internal and external studies suggest that we can, we can garner benefit from extending the interval uh, in, in terms of reducing systematic disease, hospitalizations, and deaths uh, while vaccines and supplies limited. Uh, so I'll now turn this over to Dr. Harrison, who will discuss uh, considerations of ethics, equity, feasibility, and accessibility. Um, so as you've just heard from the introduction by Dr. Pappenberg, NASI hinges its recommendations upon evidence and in this case modeling, but in addition it's acknowledged that for program level um, uh, recommendations, these other programmatic factors are really important. So ethics, equity, feasibility, and acceptability factor routinely into the recommendations, including this one. And I've outlined a few of the points here on the slide relevant to this. For those interested in this uh, work and this framework, you can read about it in Vaccine 2020, but it's a standard approach with this uh, extended interval. Um, I'm going to just kind of go quickly through these in the interest of time, but I, I want to point out that the ethics um, factored into this, so risk benefit balance ex favored extending the interval between doses. Um, we also felt it was important to consider offering second doses at a shorter interval for those who had already consented. In terms of equity, this, this move allowed more people to access vaccines sooner. So again, this recommendation only exists because it was a time of scarcity. But uh, if you take key populations, vulnerable populations, um, immune compromised or one population, it is this approach that allows people to have a dose sooner, essential workers, a dose sooner than they would otherwise. And so this could allow some equity when you didn't have enough for everyone all at once. Feasibility, their uh, programs had to ensure that they had a way to plan around dosing. And so this is deemed feasible. Of course, it doesn't change the absolute number of doses. It just changes how they might be organized and distributed. And except for acceptability, we understood it was very important to be transparent about what we know, what we don't know, and what's going to be monitored to bridge that gap. Next slide, please. So the actual recommendation itself follows on the next slide, please. And this is the way the NACI statement reads. So based on the emerging evidence of the protection provided by the first dose of a two-dose series, those were the vaccines we had available at the time for COVID-19, NACI recommends that in the context of limited COVID-19 vaccine supply and ongoing pandemic disease, jurisdictions should maximize the number of individuals benefiting from the first dose, and to do this, extending the interval up to four months after the first. Second dose should be offered as soon as possible after all eligible populations have been offered the first doses and with priority given to those who are at the very highest risk of severe illness and death factoring in our pandemic goal from COVID-19 disease. Vaccine, vaccinated people with one or two dosage should continue to follow the recommended public health measures. This is a layer of protection. It's going to be our most valuable layer, but it's one of many at this time, and it allows this approach to work to keep people safe in the best way we can. NASI will continue to monitor the evidence on effectiveness of the extended dose, and you see that commitment reflected in the statement. Next slide, please. So the key messages, I'm just going to summarize everybody here, um, that, that um, for those that didn't know, further to the rapid response on this topic, which was a decision made March 3rd, um, you then saw the full statement April 7th. And so I encourage you to look at the full statement if you're interested in these details and you will find the evidence summaries that you've seen presented here therein. Um, extending the vaccine dose intervals will optimize early vaccination rollout for population protection. I hope we've uh, been able to illustrate that for you, uh, allowing more people to gain protection sooner. Jurisdictions may choose to shorten the interval between the first and second and specific populations based on local epidemiology, local vaccine supply, public health considerations, and emerging data. So again, you see this commitment to have things evolve as the pandemic evolves and as our supply evolves. Vaccine effectiveness against variants of concern is also being monitored very closely, and of course, especially as they increase here in Canada. Next slide, please. So I, if you want to read this statement, it's there. It is separate from this statement on the slide, which is the NACI statement on COVID-19 vaccines. We wanna just highlight for you here that these are evergreen. So these are updated as recommendations, update on the actual um, vaccine products and the guidance for use. The way to navigate the statements is to go to this page. They'll all look like this. You'll see the word recommendations if you want to see the recommendation, but be aware there's rationale below. And to read the full statement through will give you a lot of the details that may answer the good questions that I know many people have. Next slide, please. 
So historically, statements are transcribed into the Canadian Immunization Guide. If you want to stay abreast of these topics in real time, I recommend subscribing. For those of you that haven't, I'm sure I, in this group, many of you will have, but please do subscribe if you want to see when these statements are coming out, it may be helpful to you. And with that, uh, I will close and I'll hand it over to you, um, Dr. Kilkelly. Great, thank you so much to um, our speakers um, and for all of you uh, for helping us through these days of technical challenges. I realize we're at time, and um, but there's a lot of good questions. So I think we're gonna go a couple of minutes over to attempt to answer some of these questions, acknowledging that some of the speakers are gonna have to go, some of the audience members are gonna have to go, but. Um, I think given the interest and the time commitment um, that, that so many of you have made today, it's, it's important that we address at least one question. So unfortunately, we're not going to address questions um, about um, like off, off, out of scope for this um, statement on, on intervals, i.e. we're not going to address questions on, on mixed schedules at this time. But there is um, one very interesting question from the Q&A about um, older adults and immunocompromised uh, people um, and, how, and how these groups should think about these dosing intervals and, and, and how it impacts um, their, their immune responses. So um, I'll ask uh, maybe Dr. Wachowski or Dr. Harrison, Dr. Papenberg, if they have any um, comments specifically speaking to the older adults and immunocompromised populations that they'd like to make at this time if they're able, acknowledging that we're over time. Uh, Robin, do you wanna start? You want me to start? Um, okay, I'll start quickly and you follow up with, um, so I'll just say, um, th th this, th these, these are the groups to watch, but partly from what we know from other um, pathogens and, and this one being no exception. But the single greatest challenge we have in looking at how best to protect, for example, immune compromised individuals is, is that there are so many unknowns. And so it isn't clear what the best way to do that. So is it, for example, through direct protection through immunization, as we, we've just been talking about, because they weren't included in the efficacy trials? Or, or is it through indirect protection by getting more vaccine to others around them? In addition, when there are many missing pieces in of the protection when you're looking at uh, direct protection, do they need two doses to be fully protected? Do they need three doses? Um, is it the B cell response or the T cell responses that are harder to measure, but we know are important for viruses? And what is that correlative protection in the when you're looking at lab data, which is what we're getting first on this population? Um, is that going to be meaningful for them? So that is the biggest challenge that exists. So what you see reflected in the statement is an absolute commitment to continue continue monitoring this data and revise recommendations because the good news is for the two particular populations you mentioned, immune compromised and elderly, there are studies being done and those are going to inform everybody going forward. So uh, that's the challenge we have. I'll let uh, Dr. Warshawski add any comments she may have. Yeah, uh, just the comment that I, I would make is that based on where we are now, most people will be able to get a second dose based on our supply very rapidly in the next you know month or two. So I think that's very important to keep in mind. So even if the immune response and potentially the effectiveness is lower in those groups, which it may be, um, it's not that long to wait for a second dose. And I think it's also really important for people to know that but despite their vaccination, very important for everyone to continue with those public health measures, as you mentioned, to make sure that that extra layer is added on top of vaccination while waiting for that second dose um, in that interim period. Thank you both so much. Dr. Papenberg, did you have any other comments you wanted to make on this topic? No, I think that's that, that, that really covers it. Great. Um, and maybe we'll sneak in one more question. Um, this is kind of a synthesis of some questions that um, have, have been in the chat um, relating to the durability of protection um, and from, from one dose and indeed from two doses. Um, and, and there are a few questions about booster doses. Um, so there's, there's a, I'm sure a lot to unpack there, but if any of you have comments about um, durability of protection or, or booster doses, um, I think those would be welcome. I mean, I could start off with, with that. Um, 
in terms of durability of protection, we do see, we do know from the AstraZeneca trial that uh, up to 12 weeks, certainly there was no a drop in the evidence of vaccine efficacy, um, and uh, we're you know that evidence from the randomized controlled trial, uh, and you take our understanding of how a single, the first dose of multiple dose vaccines uh, tend to work in other pathogens, uh, you know, think about hepatitis A or others, uh, we don't tend to see a drop off in immune, uh, in, in immunity or protection within the first six months. So we were kind of expecting to see good protection for the first, uh, you know, 12, uh, 12 weeks and beyond. Um, and certainly with the effectiveness data that's coming out of different places, including the UK, uh, whether it be for the AstraZeneca or the mRNA vaccines, is certainly eight weeks and beyond. We're still seeing really good levels of immunity, and uh, there are some data now up to 12 weeks as well. So this is kind of where we're at, and the, the evidence in terms of how long that first dose uh, uh, immunity lasts is certainly evolving, um, but there's it's certainly no indication at this point that we're seeing any sort of sudden drop off uh, within this uh, time period of the first uh, uh, 12 to 16 weeks. And I would just like to add, I think someone else in the question had a, a really good question. So if, if there might be benefit in waiting, why aren't we waiting and, and going right to four months, for example, sort of turning this around? So, so one obvious reason is that's not how the vaccines were studied. Um, so we're cognizant of the fact that the product monographs you know, were studied at a much tighter interval. And that, of course, we can all be thankful to uh, industry for doing that. It helped us. That's why we had vaccines before December 31st of 2020. It was amazing. But it's because they use the shortest interval possible. So what's helpful now is these uh, effectiveness studies, these study groups that, um, that uh, Dr. Pavenberg was just mentioning that are, are well set up to monitor effectiveness going on. So we are staying tuned. Um, and, um, and four months gave flexibility to provinces. But as you saw in the recommendation, it says up to, but sooner, you know, dial it back, do it as soon as you can. Um, get everybody vaccine and then get a second dose as soon as you can. And there's a round two here where there's opportunity to prioritize those high risk groups. And it's, as uh, Dr. Warshawski said, the time is now, which is good news. Great. Um, well, acknowledging that we are very over time now, <laughs> um, thank you um, to, to the panelists for, for staying on and to the um, the attendees for, for helping us, uh, staying on with us through our technical difficulties. Um, this is part of an ongoing discussion that uh, FAC and NCCID and other public health partners are continuing to have. Um, there's some questions in the chat about the variants, but um, uh, just to let you know that we're, we're planning a webinar um, next month uh, who'll, that will discuss that specifically. And as the evidence and the NACI statements evolve, we'll continue to discuss. So um, we'll leave it there, acknowledging um, the grateful support from NCCID. For those of you who want to watch this all again or have colleagues and friends who can make it to this one, the recording will be available on NCCID.ca. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll end it there. <laughs>